Commander John Harrington dreamed about being an astronaut when he was just eight years old. Today, he encourages kids to pursue their dreams and seek out opportunities in space, on a mountain, or in a classroom. He is a space shuttle veteran, the first Native American astronaut to fly in space. He has a degree in applied mathematics, and he is a former U.S. Navy officer. He was also a college dropout once. It is my pleasure to welcome John Bennett Harrington to Studio 4 to tell us more. Hi, Fanny. How are you? Of course, we have to go fine. We have to go right to the, he was a college dropout uh, okay. once. <laughs> Wasn't motivated, didn't study. You don't study, you don't pass your tests. Really? So, yeah, but uh -huh. I had people that motivated me and had a job, and a guy that convinced me to go back to school. So, figured it out, took a while. <laughs> Take me back to when you were eight, uh, wow. dreaming. Sitting in a cardboard box, Black Forest, Colorado. Cardboard box, my brother, uh, myself, a guy named Lynn Miller, laying on our backs with little drawings inside the box and dreaming we were going to the moon because that's what we were doing, 1967 or so. Mm. Yeah. And and people had landed on the moon then, right? Hadn't landed on the moon yet. They were getting there. Okay, but, getting there. But you were watching it. It was on TV, and mm -hmm. you were always paying attention to it. And it was a remarkable thing. And so as a kid, that's who I admired. But I never thought it's something I could accomplish. Any pilots in your family? My dad. My dad was an instructor. Gave me my first flying lesson when I was about 10. Really? And so I had this. We actually had two. We had a small plane, and we would fly that. But I took for granted the fact that I got to fly in a small plane. And it wasn't until I was in the Navy I got a license. So, a small plane, a little Cessna, a Piper, a what? We had a Cessna, had an Aronica Champ, a little teeny mm. Aronica Champ, yeah, two-seater, a lot of fun. The thrill of it all. Very much. How tough was it to get into uh, uh, flight school to, to become a pilot? Well, I had to go through officer candidate school. I graduated mm. from college. Uh, I had a gentleman I tutored in calculus, who was a retired Navy captain who flew, flew in World War II convinced me to join the Navy. So I saw the movie Officer and Gentleman, Buffy St. Marie sang that, the uh, <laughs> award-winning song for that. And then uh, I did that, that was a lot of fun. I joined the Navy, did, uh, uh, geez, 22 year career. Um, flight school right out of Officer Candidate School. About a year and a half doing that, so. Mm. Test um, pilot. Did that for about three years, yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, who washed out in those days? Is that what they call it? I know there's a lot of lingo in flight school, but if you don't make it, yeah. I don't mean you throw up in your mask or something, but if you just don't make it, you can't do it, don't have the right stuff, what goes on? Well, some folks just don't, they can't, they can't do the hand-eye. They mm. get uncomfortable in the airplane. They can't handle not just flying the airplane, but people talking on the radios and the emergencies and the procedures, and they just they can't do it, so they, they leave. They go off and do something else. What does it feel like to uh, fly an aircraft? Like it's, that. Uh, you're the one responsible for you. And if you have mm. a crew on board, you're responsible for them. So it's the idea of being able to accomplish something that's very can be very challenging, very difficult. It can be very boring at times. It can be very exciting at times. Mm -hmm. It's how do you how do you manage all those things and do it well? That's what it's about. Did you apply to be an astronaut? Did they recruit you? How does it no, work? No, I applied twice. Actually, it's uh, when I came out of test pilot school, I didn't have a master's degree. I knew to be competitive for the astronaut corps, I needed one. So the Navy sent me off to get a master's degree. I did that in aeronautical engineering. Uh, I applied again. Now I had the master's degree, plus I was a, a fixed-wing test pilot, plus I had a you know technical background, and it just worked out that I was I made the cut. So okay, so you make the cut. Make the cut. And off you go to training school. You go to NASA down Johnson Space Center for um, learn how to be an astronaut. Learn is this in Houston? This is in Houston. Yeah. And how do they start you? Uh, books. We had a stack of books. It was probably about yay tall. We had to just read them. We had tests. We had simulators. Mm -hmm. We were constantly being tested on our knowledge. But it was knowledge that you were going to apply. And so it was, it was fun to learn. And sure. plus you learn about NASA as well. And when they say your specialty will be this, do you have a choice or do you pick your specialty? You know, if you want to grow gerbils in space, <laughs> can you be the one who does that? Well, or do they say, you're an aeronautical engineer, this person is a neuroscientist, you'll do this, I'll do that. How does it that's work? That's a great question. What they do when they select you, you're selected with a pool of people. In my case, it was flight test and engineering. Now, if I was a life scientist or an in, a doctor, I'd be, I'd be screened with those folks. And so I wasn't competing mm. with people that were doctors. I was competing with people that were engineers or test pilots. Right. And, and in my case, I didn't fly the shuttle. I was a mission specialist, so I competed with a certain group. Uh, and then when I uh, actually flew, they said, well, you're going to do this. You're very good at this. I sat on the flight deck, engineer, plus I also did three spacewalks. So Really? Yeah, that was fun. My. So three spacewalks. Mm -hmm. um, how do you do that? 
You hang on pretty tight initially. <laughs> you do. Well, what yeah. are you wearing? Let's start there. Well, the suit you wear weighs about 300 pounds, roughly, and it's uh, uh, pressurized to about 4.3 pounds per square. It's, it's pressurized so that you can still live in it and breathe in it, uh, but you have to go out and do work in it, and so it has to be flexible enough to handle the tools. Mm -hmm. Just hanging on and crawling along the, the space station and, and hanging on with your hands. You'd be so good at a cocktail party. That's fun. <laughs> I bet, because you say, well, what were you doing? Well, I was, you know, out doing a spacewalk. Well, you don't, you don't, it doesn't come up in normal conversation. Put Probably it <laughs> not. But what were you doing there? So, yes, you spacewalk. Right. What are you doing? Well, we assembled a large truss on the outside of Space Station. That's the first one on the left side. So my job is actually go out and connect, make connectors, uh, you know, put blankets over boxes. I had to remove a lot of launch locks off of different hardware. I actually rode the Canadian arm, the SSRMS, robotic arm, from one side of Space Station to the other, holding a thousand pound cart in my hands for about 30 minutes. Thousand so, pound cart, but there's no gravity, it weighs, so... It weighs nothing in space, yeah. What happens in space if you get the flu? Uh, don't. I mean, if you get, if you get sick... <laughs> don't get sick. If you're, if you're in the helmet, if you're in the suit, and you, you did get sick, it would, just, it would be bad. You could, you could breathe it in. It would not, mm. be, it not be good, so don't get sick. No, but even a cold, or you just don't feel right. You have a you headache. Is there a... Well, there's lots of doctors on board, I'm sure, doctor types who could figure something out. But do you have a drug kit? There's you know, a drug kit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know when you go whitewater rafting or something, there's always the drug yeah. kit in case somebody has an there's, issue. So in space, same thing. There's a medical kit if for some reason, you, and a lot of folks feel uncomfortable. When you first get there, it's just different. All the fluid in your body shifted. You feel very congested. A lot of folks take things to decongest. When you mm -hmm. do a spacewalk, you actually uh, take uh, uh, something that will actually decongest you so you don't get an ear block. Uh, as you change right. pressure in the suit. Sure. Mm -hmm. And what about the food? Food's good. Uh, I eat, uh, I actually take peanut butter and put it on a tortilla before I got on my spacewalks. Because, uh, you, <laughs> you know, peanut butter, yeah, peanut butter uh, burns a long time. It's uh, mm -hmm. a lot of calories. It's good for you. So no yeah. nerves there if you can have peanut butter on a tortilla. Yeah, slap it on, roll it up, eat it, and mm -hmm. then you put the helmet on, you can't eat anything for about eight hours. So. What uh, hydration? Is that a natural thing that is somewhere in the suit there's water pumping into your... Mouth well, if you want it, how does that work? There's a bag that actually mounts inside of the suit and there's a little bite valve that sticks up mm -hmm. and you actually you squeeze on that and you just you suck the water. Sure, because you'd way. have to stay hydrated, I yeah, would think. Yeah, but you nothing to eat, just just up to Keep drink. the brain working. How do you communicate yeah. uh, when just, you're actually in the ship? Uh, in the ship you'll you know pick up a radio and uh, Mm -hmm. a microphone, talk back to the ground via different types of communication systems. In the suit, you're constantly, you're constantly speaking, you don't have a button to push, so everybody hears you. It's, it's a uh, ultra high frequency, a UHF frequency, so people can actually hear that. On the ground, if you're passing overhead, they will hear you talk if they're tuned into the right spot. Right. Yeah. Uh, when uh, you connect with the NASA people, the people on the ground, mm -hmm. Are they running the show or are you running the show? How does all that work? Well, the you have a timeline. Order. You have a timeline you have to follow and you'll go through that. And sometimes things don't work as they're planned, so mm -hmm. you have to improvise. But the folks on the ground are working with you to make sure that you're doing it in the right order. And if you can't, they help you get it into the right order. And if it doesn't work, you do it yourself. So, But you're in constant communication. It's, it's sure. not like there's times it drops out. It, it can, and then you still go through what you're supposed to do. Uh, how do you prepare mentally? Uh, for their spacewalks, you're actually doing it in a pool. You actually train to walk in space in a pool. Uh, in a swimming pool. In a swimming pool, yeah. So Under the water, on under, top of the water. Under the water. You're floating, you're floating uh, neutrally buoyant. You still weigh something in the suit, so right. you know, the suit rises up and it's uncomfortable. Uh, but going upside down, the blood rushes to your head in the pool, but in space, upside down is not upside down. It's just not. It's, <laughs> exactly. You're right side up. Mm. Yeah. So uh, in the simulator, mm -hmm. it must have been one thing. In reality, a different thing. different thing. What was different? Oh boy. Um, lots, I'm lots, sure. Lots, lots. You know, mm -hmm. In the simulator, everything goes wrong, constantly goes wrong. I mean, they constantly throw stuff at you. So on actual launch, you may have one thing, you know, that happens, and, and but it's the excitement of everything else that adds to the experience of doing it. So, you know, one malfunction going on ascent can be incredibly demanding where you might do 20 uh, failures in the simulator. So it's that, it's that added experience of being in the actual vehicle. Mm -hmm. So like any good pilot, you've practiced and practiced over and, and over practiced over. and you've gone through touch and goes or whatever they're called uh, so that you know how to pull out of something if it's not right. right. Uh, and you just hope none of that happens. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> you should do it. <laughs> I should do it, yes. Okay, I'd love to. Who wouldn't like to do it? I guess some people wouldn't like to do it. But at some point, I know Richard Branson says, right. maybe right. one day, 
uh, an ordinary citizen. Well, he'll Once probably again, be the first ordinary to, citizen to do that, I think. He probably yeah. will, yeah. because he's got the bucks. Yep. And I'm sure it's an expensive trip, yep. that trip. How did it change how you feel about afterlife and aliens and UFOs and things that go bump in the night? Well, there are things you see in space that you can't explain. It's because you've never seen them before. And it takes oh. somebody else that's been there to say, well, that's what that is. I saw stuff that I couldn't explain, but someone else would go, oh, that is this. I'd saw, I saw little teeny flickers of light at night. I had no idea. Well, little fires burning in the, in the desert in Saudi Arabia, you know, oil well fires really? and things like that. You know, I have no idea what that is. Uh, things going past the shuttle, flying past faster than you. Well, it's something that's been ejected out of one of the, the jets. Right. The particle flying faster than you. Well, I didn't know that. No, it's well, not. A, it you knew it wasn't a bird. Yeah, I knew it wasn't a bird. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, but yeah. something flying by. What does the Earth look like? It's moving, uh, moving pretty fast. Mm. It, usually you just see a picture, and now you're up there looking out the window, and you go, wow. And seeing places you've been as a kid or where you've grown up, you know your family's down there, but you can't see them. That uh, makes you feel very small. I bet. Yeah. And, and the color? Beautiful. Uh, when, sun's come up, when the sun comes up, uh, it's just this incredible oranges and blues and purples and everything. Just absolutely gorgeous. Mm. But you, it's really hard to stop and go and appreciate it because you're so busy. You're I'm really sure. So busy. Yeah. Uh, but you, could you find Oklahoma? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I took some good pictures of Oklahoma. <laughs> I <yeah>. bet you <laughs> did. Okay. We'll come back with John Harrington, uh, Commander John Harrington, and talk more about being an astronaut.